Hello, I'm FTX Toycat, and today I wanted to make a follow-up or a part two to the fascist Minecraft village video. And I know a ridiculous sentence that is to start a video with, uh, but it is something that's important to talk about because in the same way that the real world has never had a fascist state that's lasted more than even a single lifetime, in that same way, the rules of Minecraft change very frequently, and just in the last update, the village and pillage update, the rules for how villagers do work has changed entirely too. So you can no longer run it like a fascist state by just having lots of houses. Instead, the rules have entirely changed, and today I wanted to talk about what those rules are and how you can use them to your advantage, either to make, again, a, a nice oppressive state a little bit further forwards than fascist Italy, or so you can actually get the most off your Minecraft villagers, because right now they're running around not trading anything with each other or with me, which is not what we want. So yeah, let's dive straight into this. And we're going to start by strengthening the walls around the village. You know, I kind of made these as like, uh, oh yeah, we're going to have lots of doors and it's going to be just a way to keep people trapped inside. But as it turns out in the current update, you actually do want big strong walls around your village for the most part. Because now it's just not just zombie villagers you have to worry about. There's also the real and genuine fear of pillagers and, uh, you know, all the things they can do. If you have big walls, they basically can't get inside your village unless they spawn in there. Whereas if you have big strong walls around all of your village, like we're going to right now, with good platforms for you to shoot over, and use a crossbow and stuff, that means that you can effectively defend your village and just snipe out anything that comes nearby you, which means that, yeah, for the first time, you actually want real strong walls with real, you know, guard platforms for you to shoot the villagers from and any friends and any helpers or etc. which is a really interesting twist of fate that, like, oh yeah, this little castle we made before is now really useful. It's kind of like how in the real world, what used to be like huge military fortifications, castles and stuff, are now like huge tourist attractions. Uh, even the city of London, like one of the biggest cities, have has giant walls there that people love to go look at, including myself. So yeah, having something that was useful before and is now coincidentally useful now is something you're going to see a lot of. But yeah, let's talk about the fact that regime change is something that happens, uh, has happened historically quite frequently. Uh, it's, it's a big problem when you have a place where like, Generally speaking, when you have a single dictator, it tends to work out that he does things that are not in the interests of his people, or at the very least, uh, are not uh, in the perceived interests of the people, and that means that people want some revolution. So revolution tends to happen, or in the case of Italy, you get, you know, you're running a war, and you're running the war very badly, so eventually, you get invaded by some people, maybe the allies, and then they come in, and it's their job to be like, hey, we're the liberators now. So it's always important when you first change, you know, regime change something, you act like it's a really, really big deal. You'd be like, hey, you you know how this library is actually our prison? We're gonna make it an actual library again now. Look, we've removed the iron door. Everything has changed so much, guys. This is this is us being the good guys and saving you from everything you're doing to yourself. But yeah, well now, once you've done something big and symbolic to show, look, yeah, even though everything's basically the same as it was before, it really is a whole bunch different, then it's important to actually focus on the new needs. Because, uh, you know, as, once everyone's had a big revolution, once everyone's sick of the old change, uh, old things, you need to get people moving into the new system as fast as you can. So how do you do that, you might ask? You're going to want beds. You're going to want lots of beds, in fact, as many beds as you can make, because beds are now the thing which allow villagers to breed and reproduce. It kind of makes sense because previously, the way a house was considered was based on how many doors you had in your villages, which I mean, like, it was a good first estimate because most houses do have doors, whereas the new measure they use is not any of this stuff because it doesn't really make too much sense, but instead it's based on beds. So now every house should have a bed, which honestly is a bit more realistic in my opinion, and it means that now all you have to do is place a bunch of beds, and then as you can see, based on these little sparkles, the village has increased its population limit. If you have a big village from before, you don't need to worry about this so much, you just need to do it, mostly for symbolic reasons, like, look, I care about your needs, look how many beds I have, even though they're literally a field all the way on the other side of the village to where you are. But look, I'm so great. I, I installed all these beds for you. You know, we're going to have a bunch of these just in a little line here. And uh, yeah, basically, you can keep the old system in place, but you make it look like it's all shiny and new and stuff. And we're doing this with beds today. But we need to focus on the more symbolic and important issue. And that is the fact that villagers have nothing to do. You'll notice how if we try to trade with any of these villagers, they have nothing to trade with us, they have nothing to trade for, and this is a problem on two fronts. One, in the real world, generally speaking, if everyone has nothing to trade and nothing to trade for, you don't have an economy, your economy slows down. It's a bad thing to have everyone be dirt poor, and after a, you know, a giant war of some form, that's likely to happen. Uh, but the second issue is the less busy people are, the less people are employed, the more likely you're going to have revolutions of some more, or riots or stuff like that. So you need to get the people employed. And in the real world, this usually means like some form of like, okay, let's work out something for these people to do. But in Minecraft, it's much easier. All you have to do is work out what you want the people to be doing, and then you have to craft a, uh, a table according to that need. So there's gonna be a table on screen right now. 
all you have to do is pick which uh, profession you think you'd like the most for people to do, and then you can pick from that table. Or you can just install all of them, and you'll find villagers doing all of those things. But personally, I want to have a diamond pickaxe farm. I want to use these villagers to get me a bunch of diamond pickaxes, because I want to use it to mine diamonds. I know this is starting to sound like a bit of a African blood mining state. But yeah, because brand new villagers generate with like pre-built in jobs and we have a literally jobless economy right here, we need to install these everywhere. We need to make it so every house has one of these so that everyone knows like, hey, look at all these great things you can do. And we're even gonna have a nice little job center in the center of, uh, of, of town right here where it's like, hey, smithing table, smithing table, smithing table. Everyone gets a smithing table. You get one, you get one, you get one. And we're just gonna make great skidding places where it doesn't matter how good you are at blacksmithing, it just matters that you become a blacksmith. It's kind of funny in my opinion, because the user uh, at right now in Minecraft 1.14, 1.11, there's no way to use the smithing table. It's a future feature uh, that hasn't quite been added yet. But despite that fact, you can see how these villagers, they're coming over to them, and they're gonna change their profession. And now you can see he's officially become a toolsmith. This guy as well, he's officially a toolsmith. Every single one of these is gonna allow a bunch of villagers who are previously, you know, right now they're just unemployed bums and they can't trade anything. They're worthless to me. They can come over here and they can become toolsmiths and give me great trades like bells, because you know, you gotta hit that bell. But yeah, basically we're just gonna set up these tools, uh, tool tables everywhere in the village. Everyone needs to know that like, hey, we're gonna have a lot of these, come come check them out, come skill, do your, do your stuff here. And that allows the villagers to slowly change professions like this guy, or like some of these guys who came into this house, which I just filled with toolsmiths, like this is the weapon house, I guess. And then they became tool workers as well. They all have the exact same trades where we have to give them an emerald for their terrible stone axe, which I guess we'll just take. Okay, thank you for the stone axes. And yeah, we have to go through their trades, do the normal stuff. But yeah, you've seen how now all over the village, even the ones who like didn't come directly into contact, they've realized, hey, there's a job in being a toolsmith. And even though I haven't seen the toolsmith table yet, I'm gonna become one too. You can see how all of these different villagers from all over the place all have that exact same philosophy. And that's pretty cool in my opinion. I think it's interesting that they all can just change profession on a dime like that. It is worth probably going through all the rest of them. But again, today, all I want is a diamond pickaxe farm. Look, even the guys who are inside boats, they're literally, <laughs> they can't have seen anything. But even then, they have access that sort of thing, and they even kept their old level, uh, the thing they were doing before, in their new pursuit. So that's gonna be really handy, because it means that we can level them straight up to level three if we want to. So 36 emeralds for a bell, you better believe I'm taking that deal. Wow, at the same time as, as giving me 36, uh, one bell for 36 emeralds, he's also offering me a, a, you know four iron in exchange for his one emerald. What a great deal, why don't I take him up on that all the time? Y you get the point. So yeah, now we've got a bunch of villagers of the right type. They go to sleep every night. They have happy dreams. Although they're not really dreams because they keep their eyes open. Again, this is the weirdest thing. As soon as you see it, you can't unsee it. All the villagers do when they go to bed is they just lay down flat and then do nothing. Like, I, I, I don't know. There's something extra creepy about the fact that they don't close their eyes. But again, let's not worry about that today. Let's just go to sleep. And let's show you how to exploit this even further. Because, you know, it's quite expensive to pay all these emeralds for just stone axes, which you can't really use anyway, right? So every now and then in the village, you're gonna hear a faint noise like that, like a little ding, ding, ding sound. And that lets you know that the villagers are skilling. This would allow them to resupply. So if I wanna keep buying their terrible axes, even that same villager who previously had run out, I think it's this guy, right? Yeah, it's the same guy. I can now trade with him until he reskills. So yeah, now no longer do you have to just like, you have to take their 15 coal for one emerald trade. Instead, you can just wait until he skills. You can follow him around all day if you want to, and then you can work out what he's doing there. So this is another 1.14 villager difference. I feel I should mention because just by random chance, we have a wandering trader in the village with us. So yeah, fun fact, you now get these guys. They temporarily spawn with their two llamas. They don't really give many trades that you want to take them up on, but sometimes if you just need some sugarcane right now, you don't want to look for it. They allow you to save time in a bunch of different things that might be your sort of thing. Again, there's it's a kind of analogous it's kind of analogous to a really expensive convenience store, or as it's called in the case of a natural disaster, like, you know, profiteering or whatever, like selling things very expensive because you probably need them right now and you're willing to pay over the price. But yeah, you can now have these wandering trade dudes who have been to the never, by the way, by the fact that they're selling you glowstone. Uh, yeah, you can have them spawn here, which I think is a, a bit of a crazy thing about the mix. But yeah, let's go back to our original problem because everything's going well in this village. We're slowly having the, the, the tra traders like get their own little things and stuff. 
But right now their trades are expensive, their trades aren't effective. It's not working for me. Also, <laughs> they're having issues all thing in here because I just have one house where everyone works. Probably wasn't smart design decision right there. But yeah, we need to, uh, you know, it, as with any, like when you take over a place, when you try to make it yours, or even if you try to make it free again, you need to get them on your side. And so far we've done a good job. We've made them employed. We've made it so they feel like great changes have been made. Like, look, wow, you can go in the library now and it sure is great in here. So, as well as this though, you often need to do some great task. In the real world, this means defeating the enemy, so we can be as simple as like, hey, you know those black flag guys? I hear you don't like them because you're way better, the white and green flag people. So you just come in here and you can kill the husk, or you can pretend to kill it if you really want to. It doesn't even really matter, as long as people feel like a thing's happened, like, wow, you sure are the strongest, you made that happen. But in Minecraft, we have a built-in mechanic which will allow you to do this, and this is called the Pillager Outpost. You need to find one of these, you need to find their big captain, and you need to kill him. So while I'm on the way to find the Pillager Outpost, I found another village, and they have some grindstones. I, I think I'd quite like one of those, so let's take that. Again, it's going to come in useful for the getting achievements part of the, <laughs> the first video. But yeah, you want to keep going until you find yourself a Pillager Outpost. This is where I was hoping we could say, and this is what it looks like, but instead I just have two cages with some iron golems, and then there's some missing stuff there. And just as an interesting difference, in case you watch my video where I spoke specifically about this, uh, this time there's dirt in the same formation that there was stone before, so I I have no idea what's happening here. Uh, it, well, I have the roughest idea that, like, in Minecraft, when you generate old worlds with new terrain, weird things tend to happen, because again, I've just been playing through various updates, and through those updates, the terrain that's meant to be here has slowly changed, it seems, so this is what you get as the result. I. I don't know why or how or what, but this is very, very, very weird to see, right? Like, I think we can all agree on that. So yeah, super goofy, super strange thing. But let's go find our actual nearest uh, pillager. So this is a pillager outpost. This is where our enemy for the day is going to live. And yeah, they're actually kind of intimidating, kind of tricky to run into, especially if you're playing hard difficulty. So my pro tip for the date is going to be, if you don't really care about the structure, if you don't really want to preserve it or anything like that, you can just set the whole thing on fire, uh, run away for a little bit, and then watch the blaze. And now you can hopefully see just how many pillagers are actually dying in that fire. It's kind of fun to watch. It's very satisfying to see any structure burn down, especially one filled with uh, enemies annoying as the pillager. So yeah, this makes the job a lot easier for you because now the place has burnt them a whole bunch. It's a lot easier to kill pretty much every mob inside there. Obviously when it's dark, you can have skeletons, but yeah, the, the, the dangerous, scary kind of mobs, the, the pillagers and the pillager captains, they're all gonna be found, oh, that's not a place I wanna be. They're, they're usually gonna be found in there, very damaged, or you might even get luckier than that. And it might be that he runs out because of the fire and he's just by himself and again by themselves they can still pose a threat but for the most part it's not that dangerous and when you kill him you get the bad omen effect and you get yourself one of those nice diamond achievements as a as a result so when you go to one of these pillagers homes and you raid their outpost you burn it down and you kill their leader where well, you get something called the bad omen effect which i think is a bit of a, a misnomer personally like calling it bad omen implies like oh how unlucky i am i just unluckily got this bad effect. But it's like, you know, you kind of snuck in there, you did some bad things to them, and now you're gonna bring those enemies back to your base by kind of implying this is my village. But yeah, this is actually a surprisingly similar maneuver than ha has happened in real life a fair few times. Uh, such as, for instance, when uh, Bismarck wanted to bring the German states together, back before Germany was one unified place, there was just a lot of different German countries. To bring them together, they needed a unified enemy. So basically, he insulted the French and tried to encourage them to invade as much as he could, and then, when the French inevitably evaded, as you might imagine after being goaded into it a whole bunch of times, uh, that was very beneficial. And yeah, basically he started a war for the sake of uh, trying to unify his people. And in the same way, we got a lot of people here, we gotta make sure they think that I'm the real hero. And the way we do that is we, of course, go and kill all these villagers. Although in our case we have a sizable enough army that that just happens by itself and we can just go pick up the emeralds. So the point that stands is we went out, we did a terrible thing, and that caused people to invade us, but now we're the ones that are heroically defending ourselves, and it means that we can be on the, you know, the, the, the right side or whatever, have a very easy battle to fight, because for the most part, again, we've got the golems defending us, but also, it's not particularly hard to do if you know how to defend yourself. These walls I built earlier made it a lot easier, but sometimes, funnily enough, just like, raid spawns are really weird, so we literally have a bunch of pillagers trapped in a hole here, <laughs> and it looks like one killed the other one, so... Our life gets even easier. But if you can keep your enemies in fighting, that makes it even easier than if you make your own side in fight. But yeah, one of the universal truths of combat, no matter how it does happen, even if they breach your walls or whatever, is that if you manage to stay united while your enemy 
uh, is always in fighting, you'll generally be the winner of that. Oh god, I attacked a golem. But you'll always be the winner of that conflict for the most part. So often people spend all their time working out why they hate people in their own group that they realize they forget like, oh yeah, there's an entire other group to attack, which is why having an enemy can unite so many people and which is why when you infight, you often become the weaker of two sides, it seems. This can apply to all sorts of different things, but for, for now we're just using it to say, hey, we need to unify these people in favor of how much they love me. And the way we do that is by killing all these guys and we get in exchange the hero of the village effect. We get the kind of war hero like, hey, we saved all these people. I totally didn't go out and kill someone and cause this. I saved you fellas. Thank you very much, friends. And as a thank you, because again, I, I came in here, uh, not because I had to change things because of the rules, because I wanted to. And now we get good deals and everything. Also, the villagers are meant to come up to you and give you some stuff, but I mean, I guess they're not feeling too generous today. <laughs> so yeah, you can see how like, oh, we get slightly cheaper rates on, uh, you know, like selling our iron to them. It's, wow, it's only free iron uh, for an emerald instead of uh, the other way around. That's, that sure is a better deal. Imagine if you saved a village or a city or something in real life and then they came out and they're like, hey, we're so thankful for you for saving us and here's 15% of your next car insurance purchase. You'd be like, hey, 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 what, what? So now we go around the village, we try to find our guy, you know, the one we're trying to breed into the best of the best. In fact, you know, I'm just gonna use this villager in the boat right here and we're gonna use him as our example. Uh, so yeah, as you can see, he's a level two. You can actually tell just by looking at them what level they are. So this guy in his front pocket has like a mushroom or like at, at some form of iron ingot or something. This guy has gold because he's level two. So now that we're the liberator of the village, as well as trying to trade up our one particular villager, which we'll keep on doing as soon as he restocks, uh, what we can also do is we can use stuff like the grindstone we got from elsewhere, and we can make specific villagers into specific things. Because again, they're, they're literally trapped in there. Right now they don't trade anything anymore, because again, previous villagers and previous updates won't work, but you should be able to find a villager that can skill up. And if they've got that gold thing around their, their their waist, again, that shows their seniority level, then that lets you know uh, that you've converted the right village over. I'm not sure why or how this happened, but a bunch of villagers are like trapped in a prison over here. And again, because, you know, we, we're acting like we're a whole new regime change, but we're kind of not, so we'll just leave them there. <laughs> like, yeah, hey, that was a decision made a long time ago. It was probably a good one, maybe. See, now that the village absolutely loves me, they're all on my side, they've decided, yeah, this, this toy cat guy sure is better than the old guys. What we can do is we can uh, slowly start to creep in a lot of the stuff from the old regime. Like, oh yeah, you know that iron door we had in the library before? Now it's a totally willing iron door that we have on uh, the blacksmith room. Like, it's just to keep you in there for your own well-being, really. You know, they can skill in there. It's, it's way better than it was before. Ignore the fact that they're locked up. And yeah, now we can use this to keep villages in one place for the sake of our trades. Oh my god, I didn't know this was a thing that was possible, but apparently villagers can't be locked in anymore. They can open the door themselves, it seems. I cannot stress how weird it is to see the villagers just being able to open the doors to let themselves in and out. Like, they can apparently just do as of this update. So, yeah, I guess watch out if you have iron door prisons, because <laughs> uh, as long as, I guess, villagers have the button available to them, they can press it now. Sometimes, at least. So a good secondary tool to use, if you're in the situation where, you know, like threatening villagers, keeping them locked in a room isn't working for you, like it isn't for me because they can open locked doors, then you can also use name tags and you can rename the villagers and give them a little bit of an ego boost over all of the other ones. It's really, really useful to just elevate random people at random times because then people want to be the people that are elevated above the rest. And just like that, we name the villagers that we think are uh, superior, that we're trading with basically, as the better villagers, and we single them out as being far better than the, you know, the people around them, and then people aspire to be them. And in our context, it just means we can keep track of which villagers we're trading with, you know, trying to do the best with, and which ones we don't really care about, which again, has, has two purposes like that. And the real life connection on this one, in case you're curious, uh, a good example would be, for instance, Gandhi uh, of uh, India, like his famous as like, oh yeah, he fought to end racism, right? That's a thing that he wanted to do. But no, he was actually a big fan of like having different classes of people. In fact, he was even like openly racist against black people. He just wanted Indians to be on the level of whites. And that that's like a similar example of a policy where like, oh yeah, we we don't want to end this system where there's better people and worse people. We just want to be part of the better system. You want to get everyone in, on board of that. And that's a good way to keep things going good. Oh, by the way, you should look that one up rather than taking my word for it. Like, when it, when a YouTuber makes a bold claim, feel free to look into it. Because it's this whole thing where, like, otherwise you're going to get a bunch of random comments. People are like, oh, yeah, you said a thing, but I disagree. So, therefore, I'm going to take historical fact and put my own opinions in there. It's like, you know, if you disagree, I'd love to hear your research and why. 
But yeah, look how productive the villagers are being right now. They're all skilling at the tables in this room. They've all got their little desk jobs going on and they're all slowly growing into big productive villagers. Oh, we've just leveled a villager up to level two. And now you can see, look, instead of that like kind of brownie color, it's gold now. And now we have more trades we can make every time he skills, even though we get less XP every time. But again, whole separate issue there. Oh, and just as an interesting thing, the discounted rate you get when you uh, trade the things to the villagers doesn't actually last forever. Like this guy's gone right back up to four, like, hey, you might have saved us from extinction. Again, ignore what caused the extinction, but also like, hey, I, I don't care that you saved us. But also at the same time, you know, like, uh, things are expensive, we've got to keep up costs. And it's like, hey there, man, that's that's kind of rude. Also, let's ignore the fact that I'm buying all this stuff off them then putting it right in a chest. Uh, sounds a lot like something, something military industrial complex, am I right? Haha, <laughs> high quality. It's like a political joke right there. So I've been torching up the village to protect it from mob spawning at night and just a fun little side consequence of having so many villagers is you spawn with cats now. So isn't that cute and adorable? Also the cat and the chicken are not killing each other because they're both trying to get through the door. Isn't that a beautiful analogy for life maybe? I'm, I'm not even sure. So we've got two level three traders now and uh, both of them have interesting enough, uh, like they're not that great level three trades, but I mean, they do technically exist. Like look, we can now buy Bane of Father Pods, one axes. Do we want that? Not really. But the interesting one to me is the fact that we can buy diamond axes with enchantments with this guy, and this guy over here sells diamond shovels of enchantments. So yeah, doing, doing pretty good, good I'd say. So one of the trades is 24 flint for a single emerald, and usually I feel like this is a ripoff, but like, oh no, that stuff I got while mining gravel and have far too much of, what a shame I have to sell it to them. But yeah, these axe trades are pretty terrible. Like, do I really need a Bane of Arthur Pods axe? No. But the fact that you get so much XP for one emerald is actually a pretty good deal. And like, a Bane of Arthur Pods axe is unusable by itself, but you can combine a bunch together or just use it like it's a regular axe. So honestly, it's not that bad of a deal. I think the villagers have been significantly improved in that, uh, this update, and that's a nice thing, if nothing else. Oh, and this one literally just restocked as we were trading with him. So another Bane of Arthur Pods axe for me. Sell some more iron and get some more emeralds and then buy some shovels, get ourselves over that line. So now we've got ourselves our level four trade unlocked and we can see that we can spend five emeralds, which is a lot, but we can actually get ourselves a pretty decent shovel, like unbreaking one. That's, you know, that's a free diamond basically, plus the unbreaking, it's a little bit better than that. So it's pretty good to spend five emeralds and get this, but here's the best bit. If we can get him up to level five, the master trades, then we can always get an enchanted diamond pickaxe. This is a pickaxe farm once we get them to that level. Side note, but I've never seen this before. Uh, it turns out you can anger the villagers. I'm not sure what I did. Maybe it's because they're trapped in this room. But now it's instead of one emeralds, it's two emeralds for the pickaxe. So like everything's gone up a tiny bit, it seems. Maybe I just traded it too often. But they are mad about something, it seems. I, it probably is being locked in a room, isn't it? People get so mad these days, you can't even lock them in a room without them saying, oh, it's a human's rights violation. I refuse to work under these conditions. Like, geez. Yeah, you can see how there's like anger coming from the table itself somehow. I have to imagine it's them being locked in this room that's doing it, but I don't really want to let them go. So you can you can see my my issue here. I guess as long as they don't go on like a work strike, it's not my issue. <laughs> so this phase of the process, just kind of grinding villagers, waiting for them to restock at a table, then grinding again. Uh, it does take some time. It's worth mentioning, like do something else in Minecraft or outside, but like bring something else to do, because otherwise you're just waiting for a new shovel to show up uh, every now and then. And uh, yeah, it's something you might not realize. I'm deliberately placing these beds right next to the uh, blacksmith tables so they always know what they should be thinking about because it's been taking a depressingly long amount of time for him to restock his trades. Are you going on work strike? Are you angry? What is it? Just just like, you know, I'm, I've been here for a while now. It's, it's been like a good half an hour. Okay, we've got another level four villager now and this guy is offering me for 12 emeralds a fortune one unbreaking free Bane of Arthur Pods free axe. What is it with these villagers and thinking, you know what would be great on an axe? The ability to kill spiders very slightly better. I really can't work that one out, but I guess good news, that's been fixed. Like it's such a good axe because it's gonna last four times as long. It's just, it comes with fortune needlessly, like fortune one too, like it, even if I, it was useful, it would, wouldn't be useful. And then Bane of Arthur Pods free. I just do not understand these villagers in the slightest. So you can see how we're really racking up the enchanted gear here. Like we have so much Bane of Arthur Pods 1 because there's no reason not to buy it for one emerald. And then we're also going to start getting unbreaking one shovels and these things, I guess. <laughs> oh, I guess while we're here, we should just uh, talk about because this is kind of the follow up to the last video. If you want to get the maps for various different achievements, one of the easy ways to do that is just to use a cartography table. 
Uh, this will create the librarian villagers, or the map making villagers. Basically, it's going to give you access to the type of villager that you probably do want access to. So my new theory on why all of the villagers are so mad is because they have all these crops in their village, but no one's harvesting them, because there's no default farmer profession anymore. You have to have that kind of spawn in. So we're going to put a bunch of composters near the crop fields, and that way some farmers should generate and they should do something useful for the village. That's the hope, at least. Like, oh no, I can't work without food. Oh no, toy cat. Why are you slowly destroying the house I live in to make crafting tables and beds and stuff? Like, again, everyone's always a critic. Oh, look how close we are to a level 5 blacksmith. It's worth doing the terrible useless uh, single trade here to get the max level blacksmith who will now trade me for 13, uh, like, diamond, uh, emeralds it seems. I can now get myself a diamond pickaxe. And what is the diamond pickaxe? Efficiency 2. Not what I really wanted from my trader if I'm being honest. But you can see he now has diamond as his little thing to show that he's not just a little experienced, he's all the way experienced. He's maxed out and we can buy this every single time he resupplies. 13 emeralds is now equal to one diamond pickaxe. The efficiency too is a nice little cherry on the cake in my opinion, but even disregarding that, the fact that we can buy a diamond pickaxe for 13 emeralds is really good by itself. And hopefully this second guy is going to give me a slightly better deal than that. And just like this, we've now maxed out another villager and we have access to another diamond uh, like uh, pickaxe trade. This one is 13 emeralds for efficiency 2 and unbreaking 3. This is way better than the other one, like you might want to combine the two together. But this for 13 emeralds is a steal. This is 6,000 blocks of uh, cobblestone I can mine per 13 emeralds. And given that 13 emeralds isn't too hard to obtain, like, for, you know, like, it's not that hard to come across. So, yeah, we can now do that pretty much infinitely. And bear in mind, if we keep going with more villagers in the exact same traits, like this guy, make him go all the way to the max, we'll get more and more chances at different enchantments, and one of them might eventually have Mending on, or one of them might eventually have Unbreaking um, 3, Efficiency 4, and Silk Touch. Like, you can keep on doing this till you find the right enchantment, and the best bit is, you know, even though we're focusing on Dime Pickaxes today, if you want to do it for any, because I, I love caves, and hashtag we need a cave update, but, um, like, you can do this for any one of the other rarer items at the end of the trees. Do you want to keep on getting Diamond Armor? You can do that for a certain number of emeralds, and I love the new training system because there's reasons to farm villagers and also reasons to treat them well or you know you can do the opposite but i like that there's kind of benefits and downsides to doing that and yeah that's what minecraft now has you have diamond villagers who can do this sort of thing although actually while you're here anyway mr diamond level villager let me remind you you can like this video if you did like it you can share it if you really liked it and if you want to see more toy cat videos make sure you hit that bell oh it doesn't work on the ceiling make sure you hit that bell <laughs> And then you can guarantee you'll see more on your homepage. I hope you'll enjoy this little bit of an update to a video. Fun history here and there, but mostly just teaching you how to actually make the most of your Minecraft villagers. And did you, do you see that? Oh, that's, that's strange. But yeah, I hope you'll enjoy the video because I'm going to see you all in the next one. Goodbye.